Well, hello there. Happy Thursday to each and every one of you who is joining us. As far as our time together is concerned, we greet you with Jesus' joy. And I am certainly delighted and elated that the Lord has allowed for you to join us as far as our Thursday teaching is concerned. Um, we thank God for each and every one of you. And I see, if I can see the scrolling, I see Brother Joe Weathers, my frat brother. Good to see you, Sister Valerie Truesdale, Sister Eloise Alexander, our deacon in training. I see you all in the chat. Thank God for each and every one of you, as well as others who are joining us. Um, I want to, at this time, Sister Jill, good to see you. Thank God for your presence. I, I want to... Uh, Tori, how you doing? And Sister Audrey, God bless you. But Tate, good to see you. Thank God for your presence. Um, boy, I'm getting all of these shout outs right now before I get started as far as our lesson is concerned. But I don't take this for granted of you giving up your time uh, to engage in this moment of study. And I want you to, if you wouldn't mind, sharing this on your timeline with family, friends, and others and invite them to join us for our Bible study. The wonderful thing about doing Bible study and the way that we're doing it right now is that you don't have to come out as far as traveling uh, 20, 30 minutes to the church. You can do it from the place of comfort and we can give you the word, have a good time. And then after that, you log off and go back to whatever you were doing. So we thank God for the gift of technology. I want to if I could lead us in a word of prayer as we center and, and seek what it is the divine wants us to learn as far as our time together is concerned uh, on this day. And so let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. God, we come and we thank you right now in the name of your son, Jesus. Um, and we need you, the master teacher, to show up and teach us your precepts. Uh, let your word be that lamp to our feet and light into our pathway. Show yourself strong and mighty, O oh God, even in this moment. God, we pray right now that you will open our hearts to appreciate our minds, to comprehend and our spirits to apply what we gather and glean from this time of study so that we can be more of a reflection of you in a world that needs it so desperately. Show yourself mighty and strong even now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to, if I could, call your attention to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And we want to look at verses 1 through 6. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And we're going to focus on verses 1 through 6 this, uh, this time. Um, Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. So let's unpack this. Verse one, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again in a yoke of bondage. I want you, if you would, underline the words stand fast. I want you to highlight the words, the liberty by which Christ made us free. And I also want you to highlight, do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Verse two, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. I want you to highlight the phrase, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Verse three, and I testify, I want you to circle the word testify to every man who, again, to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. I want you to underline the phrase, Every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. I want you to circle the word debtor and I want you to circle the words whole law. Verse four, you have become estranged from Christ. You have you who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. How like that whole verse? How like that whole verse? And I want you to underline the words falling from grace because I really need to unpack that so you don't walk away with the wrong perception. 
Verse five, for we through the spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. I like that. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. In verse six, I want you to underline the phrase, for in Christ Jesus. I want you to circle the words circumcision and uncircumcision. And I want you to highlight the phrase, but faith working through love. All right. Let's prepare to uh, really appreciate what Paul is trying to get um, the Christians at Galatia back then and us who are followers of Jesus Christ in 2022 to appreciate, appropriate, and apply as far as our lives are concerned. Because Paul is encouraging the Galatians to really appreciate what real freedom looks like through Jesus Christ. He's trying to get them to understand that if you try to keep the law, the Judaic law, you really put yourself in a yoke of slavery. And as you put yourself in the yoke of slavery, you kind of separate yourself from Jesus Christ. And when you separate yourself from Jesus Christ, you can't really appreciate the grace that Jesus Christ brings as far as our lives are concerned. So when we look at verse one, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled with the yoke of bondage. Paul wants us to understand that Jesus Christ is the greatest emancipator we can ever know. And when we as black people think about emancipation from the physical aspects of slavery, from the legal aspects of Jim and Jane Crow and black codes and discrimination, when we think about liberators, we think about people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King and uh, others who have fought for our rights, but the greatest liberator of all is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has come to free us from all the machinations that sin has brought to our lives. And as we walk through this particular aspect, what we got to understand is that the Apostle Paul is telling his Galatian sisters and brothers, I need you all to stand up, be firm, know that you have been delivered from slavery to heathenism because you used to be pagans that worship idol gods and polytheistic gods and a whole bunch of different other gods. You've been freed from that, but now you want to put on the yoke of trying to keep the law of the Jews and Jesus Christ has done something a whole lot better than what the law could ever do for you. Now, I need you all to understand that all of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are free from slavery to our sinful desires. But he's letting them know that they're also free from the well-meaning but unable to save Jewish law. And that freedom came at a great price. That freedom came through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because Jesus has given us liberty, he has set us free from a whole bunch of different formulas as far as you got to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G in order to get saved. He has freed us from particularly dietary laws in order to get saved. He has freed us from the judgment of God for our sins. He has freed us from a whole bunch of ritualistic and religious rules, and he has freed us from fear and guilt. The shout of it all for me is that since we are free from all of that, 
There is a certain way that we ought to live it out, rejoice in it, bask in the joy of knowing that you and I are no longer slaves to rituals, to religion, to a whole bunch of laws and things of that sort. Now, here is Paul really trying to help the Galatians not to trade one form of bondage for another form of bondage. They have been freed from heathenism of worshiping idol gods. He does not want them to take on the slavery of now trying to keep the Jewish law. Okay? And this is what the Judaizers were trying to introduce as far as the church of Galatia is concerned. He wanted them to know you don't have to be circumcised. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. In order to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And if you don't get anything else today, I want you to get this, that all of us, our Galatian brothers and sisters back then, to those of us in 2022, that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, for real, for real, we are free indeed. Jesus Christ has set us free from sin and a long list of laws and a long list of regulations. And when Jesus came to set us free, and I want you to understand, it is not free to do whatever we want to do because that will lead us back to slavery, to our selfish desires, which is worse, watch this, than worshiping a bunch of idol gods as well as being subjected to the law. Our selfish desires does more to keep us in bondage rather than for us to walk in the liberty that God desires for us to know. So when we talk about this freedom, this freedom is not for us to do whatever we think we can do. This goes back to the writings of Paul when he wrote to the church at Rome, when he said, shall we sin that we get more grace? Heaven forbid. A lot of folks tend to take this idea of freedom in Christ to be somewhat libertine. And what does that mean as far as being libertine? Me, I can do whatever I want to, how I want to, when I want to, with whomever I want to, and I ain't got to answer to nobody. No, we ain't talking about that kind of freedom. That kind of freedom leads to sin. That kind of freedom puts you in bondage. That kind of freedom really restricts you from becoming all that God will have for you to be. So we're not talking about that kind of freedom. But what we are talking about is you trying to keep a whole bunch of laws and regulations in order to gain God's approval. He is not talking about that. So let's continue this work because when we look at verse two, uh, this is where uh, Paul really drills down onto what he's trying to get these folks to understand. He says, indeed, I, Paul, say to you, that if you become circumcised, and I think the key word right there is if, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. If you become circumcised, it don't mean anything for you to have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you become caught up in this entanglement, and that word entanglement in today's culture takes on a very different meaning thanks to Will and Jada. <clears throat> uh, 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 if, if you get caught up in this entanglement, uh, you're submitting to a right that does not save you. That, that if you become circumcised trying to gain God's favor and approval, it's not going to work. Paul wants us to understand that if you're doing it for that reason, the salvation of Christ is basically, eh, doesn't mean anything. All right. Now, what I want to get us to understand is that Paul is not condemning circumcision in and of itself because Paul was circumcised, all right? Uh, even 
uh, his son in ministry, Timothy, was circumcised. And here is Paul arguing about circumcision. And ultimately, the only folks that could get circumcised were the men. So this totally leaves the women uh, from, 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 from a bodily perspective out of the equation when you're talking about circumcision. But in Paul's later writings, he talks about how all of us can be circumcised because our hearts can be circumcised. Okay. Paul is issuing this strong warning to his Galatian brothers and sisters that the Judaizers are telling you that you need the Jewish law to make you right and perfect. In other words, we're going to mix some Judaism with this gospel for your own improvement. Now, I'm getting ready to say something that I know may, may offend some folks, uh, particularly in today's culture, because we have the same thing that is happening as far as even with some of our African-American brothers and sisters who engage in what I call syncretism whereby we take some African traditional religion like Yoruba and stuff like that, and we want to mix it with the gospel. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Okay. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. God's way is different. Our salvation is by our faith in Jesus Christ because of grace. That's it. You ain't got to mix nothing. You ain't got to match nothing. Uh, it is by grace. We don't mix and match works and grace. All right. This is God's wonderful arrangement. And this is the scandal of the gospel. The scandal of the gospel is that by grace are we saved through faith, not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. It's a gift, beloved. And if you're saying that in order for me to get saved, in order for me to get saved, that I have to become circumcised, then Jesus' death means nothing. Now, this is what I want you to understand when we start talking about gift. A gift is just that. It's a gift. You can't pay for it. You can't earn it. It's given. All right. Let me say it again. Can't pay for it, can't earn it, it's given. It's a gift and it's given out of grace and love. So really what Paul is saying, if you want to get circumcised, if you want to get circumcised, you are basically discarding the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. In other words, circumcision invalidates crucifixion. <laughs> circumcision will invalidate the cross. Circumcision basically invalidates the resurrection of Jesus Christ because when you're rejecting Christ's provision for our salvation, then you're also rejecting the basis for him telling you how to live your life. In other words, you want to try to go back to a whole bunch of other stuff that really has no salvific power. Now, let me, if I could, because I really want us to understand this is how the enemy works as far as our lives are concerned. And unfortunately, and even interestingly, we have a lot of folks who devalue the atoning substitutionary work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay? Um, but I'm here to let you know that had it not been for his death and his resurrection, remember, resurrection is coming in, in several days. Uh, we're going to celebrate Good Friday, not on tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. Um, that is very important for us to understand, not only doctrinally, but to appreciate salvifically. So if we said the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary and his resurrection don't mean nothing, then that means we got to trust our works, our merit, our own goodness, and our religion. And we doubt the power of Jesus to deal with our sins. And what Paul is saying is, no, 
I don't want you to get caught up in the idea that you got to be circumcised in order to be saved. Hallelujah. But now watch this. We know that the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what secures the very essence of our salvation, which means that I don't have to rely on my works, my merit, my goodness for religion to save me. That the power of Jesus' death and resurrection took care of all the penalty for my sins. But this is what the devil would do. The devil will use memories of our past to accuse us and always points out our shortcomings to condemn us. And that's why you got to know who you are in Christ Jesus because our faith does not need to be law oriented. It needs to be Christ centered. Our trust is based upon the redeeming atoning work of Jesus Christ, not our ability to live up to a whole bunch of man-made laws. Okay. All right. So Paul is saying these Judaizers who are coming in trying to get you to go get circumcised, brothers, you don't have to do that. And then notice what he says in verse three. He says, and I testify again, which means that he had told them this before, <laughs> to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. Uh-oh, uh-oh, this is where the rubber hits the road because Paul is saying, all right, if you want to go get circumcised, trying to earn God's favor, trying to get saved, then you make yourself subjected to all 600 plus laws as far as Judaism is concerned. And if you break one of the 600 plus laws, you have broken the entire law. And if you break the entire law, then ultimately you commit a sin. If you break one law, you broke the entire law. If you break the entire law, you have committed sin. So there was no way, no way for any person that was of Jewish persuasion to keep all of the law perfectly until Jesus Christ. Until Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul, Paul wants them to know, um, don't put yourself under the subjection of trying to keep and in some renderings, it's 613, others say 616 laws. So between 613 and 616 laws, however you want to define that. Don't put yourself under the subjection of trying to keep all those laws. And you got to remember that when you look at the Judaic law, uh, it was really divided in three categories. Religious, moral, and ceremonial. Religious, moral, and ceremonial. And all of that had to be kept perfectly. Um, here's where we get in trouble because the unfortunate reality is so many of us think that we have to do good works in order to save ourselves and make us right with God. And, and that, doesn't, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Now, let me, if I could, I want to talk about talk about circumcision because back during that time and particularly for Jewish men it was the act of circumcision that identified them as a Jew okay it was the act of circumcision that 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 identified them as being part of the covenant nation of Israel so in a sense, circumcision symbolized having the right background and doing everything required by religion. But many of us know no amount of work, no amount of discipline, no amount of moral behavior saves us. If you count on finding favor with God by being circumcised, then you're going to have to obey the whole law completely. Okay? 
Now, this is the shout for me. This is the shout for me. Because I can see somebody saying, well, isn't there some good in the law? Doesn't that count for something? It might count for something with God as far as us being able to express thanks for what God has done. But not if we're expecting God to see our flawed effort of trying to engage in perfect performance because the only requirement or the interest requirement to the kingdom is a holy life. And ultimately, the only way that you and I can live a holy life is we got to be clothed in Christ to ultimately be acceptable to God. Ah, uh, let me let me look at look at verse four. It says, "You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace." Wow. 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 In other words, if you try to keep the law through the act of circumcision, you have basically alienated yourself, separated yourself, estranged yourself from Jesus Christ. And this is where I'm getting ready to mess some of us up. Because for God, there is no gray area. It's either Jesus or it's the law. It ain't both. Okay? It's either grace <laughs> or the law. It ain't both. It's either legalism or walking in love. It ain't both. All right? So, Really what Paul is trying to help us understand is that when it comes to either Christ or the law, you can't have it your way. You got to choose a side. Okay? Got to choose a side. All right? So either it has to be Jesus or it has to be the law. Because if you want to see justification by the law, you're alienating yourself from the Christ. And when you alienate yourself from the Christ, you can't even bask in the grace that God has given you through Jesus Christ. Okay? If the Galatians believed that circumcision was necessary for salvation, they would leave the aspect of being saved by grace for the Mosaic law system that said you got to keep these 613, 616 laws. And let me just say it. I'm, I'm getting ready to mess with some of us. The same mistake is repeated today when a believer leaves a church that emphasizes salvation by grace through faith and joins a church which teaches that salvation depends upon repentance, confession, faith, baptism, and church membership. Uh-oh, I think I just messed somebody up. In other words, if you don't get nothing else, get this. I am not saved by joining a church. I'm not saved by being baptized. I am not saved uh, by repeating some confessional aspect. I am not saved uh, by doing repentance the way you want me to do it. I am saved by the grace of God through faith. Now watch this. Now once I understand what salvation is all about and what it does for me, then it leads to repentance and it leads to confession and it leads to baptism and it leads to me admitting my faith and it leads to me wanting to become a part of a community of faith. But none of that stuff is necessary for God to extend grace to me. Oh, I think I just said so. Because when we allow for the grace of God to operate in our lives in an amazing way, it'll make you repent. 
and it'll make you confess Jesus as Lord. And it'll lead you to operating in faith. And it'll lead you to wanting to be baptized through immersion and to become part of the church. Now, here's where I got to, 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 to drive home something because uh, Paul says, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Let me help you to understand two things. Number one, the path, of legal, the path of legalism and the path of grace never, never converge. Okay. If we insist on doing um, life with a Burger King mentality, in other words, having it my way, we step off the way of Jesus Christ. The Proverbs reminds us, uh, I believe it's in Proverbs 14, 12, there seems to be a, a way right to man, but it's death or it ends in death. So we got to understand that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except by me. And all I'm trying to help somebody to understand is that I take the words of Jesus Christ very seriously. I believe he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Father except by me. So for me, Jesus Christ is ultimately the way that I have a relationship with God that is empowering, enriching, and allows for me to bask in the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. Now, let me get let, let, let me let me talk about this Father from grace. Because I don't want you to walk away thinking. That when Paul's words, you have fallen away from grace, should not be taken out of the context of mean that you lost your salvation. Okay? Because <laughs> I'm getting ready to give you some good teaching. Grace does not equal salvation. Ooh! Grace is the way we get salvation. <laughs> ah! Let me say it again. Grace does not equal salvation. Grace is the way we get saved. So if you want to use the law as a way of salvation, you are setting aside grace and therefore you're falling away from grace. It is like, it is like, um, uh, you know what it's like? This is what it's like. It is like you being in a pool on the deep end, not knowing how to swim and a lifeguard jumps into the water trying to save you and you keep throwing water in the lifeguard's way and the lifeguard can't get to you. Okay? That's what that's like. I'm trying to save you, but, 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 uh, you keep throwing stuff my way. Let me see if I can help us today because this is where grace is just absolutely amazing and astounding. Because we got some churches that act just like the Judaizers. Okay. Um, you can't tell a person how to live when you're downplaying the grace of God. Okay. When you really understand what grace is all about, for real, for real, it makes you want to live a certain way. Because the aspect of grace does not mean you live any kind of willy-nilly way. All right? You and I are saved by faith in Jesus Christ because of the grace of God. And so all I'm trying to let you know is that when you're trying to keep a whole bunch of laws, trying to get saved, you really dismiss the grace of God. Uh, let me do verse five and six and, 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 and I'm going to call it a day. Paul says, for we through the spirit eagerly waits for the hope of righteousness by faith. Um, 
Here is, in verse 5, the aspect of justification by faith. Okay? Now, I'm trying not to shout because I'm teaching. Uh, but it's by faith. And that's faith in Christ and the faithfulness of Christ. Not in our works. Not in us paying money. Not in us reading our Bible not in us coming to church. It is by faith in Christ and the faithfulness of Christ that we eagerly await. In other words, we don't work for righteousness. We grow in righteousness. Ooh, I hope I'm, I hope I'm teaching good. By the spirit, not through anything we can do or have done, not through the law, but it is the spirit that produces the righteousness in us, that gives us the strength to wait for the hope of the perfection of Jesus Christ that takes place in glory. We have a hope that other folks cannot dare grasp. That's why we're able to sing that song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. In Christ, the solid rock I stand. By Christ, the solid rock I stand. Of Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. It is because of the personhood of Christ that you and I have relationship with God by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So when we look at these words, faith and spirit, uh, it is what separates those who keep the law from those who are growing because of the grace of God. Here's what the here, here is what here is what the Judaizers were really doing. Judaizers, because they were talking about circumcision, were trying to gain salvation in the flesh. Now I ain't got to go too deep on that, but I think you get the gist of it. Snip, snip, clip, clip, you're saved. Nuh uh. God is saying salvation ain't a snip, snip, clip, clip. Salvation is faith in Jesus Christ that is bestowed upon you by the grace of God that allows you to have access to God the Father, not in and of yourself, but because you are in Christ. <laughs> Watch this, watch this. And, and this serves as a wonderful segue to verse six. For in Christ, verse six, for in Christ, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. In other words, though salvation is by faith apart from works, Faith that is genuine does work itself out through love. Did y'all catch that? Did you see that? Paul is saying, listen, if you're in Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. That means nothing. But if you're in Christ because you have faith in Christ, you're willing to work to demonstrate love. Ooh, James comes to mind when he talks about how faith without works is dead. And I would dare say that works without faith is dead too. So it takes both what? Faith and works in order to do this thing for in Christ. This is what you got to understand. You got to be in Christ. Got to be in Christ. In, in Christ. Being uncircumcised is not a barrier to being saved. That's all Paul is saying. And Paul is saying that if you're not circumcised, doesn't mean you can't get saved. But if you are circumcised, doesn't necessarily mean you are saved. Ooh, I think I just said something. So circumcision, be it whether you're circumcised or not, has nothing to do with your salvation. Let me see if I can bring this home and, and call it today. Because I, I got... I, uh, 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 Paul wants us to understand, and this is really for, for people who have fallen away, because you do know we can fall away. Uh, 
Um, and, and this is why I'm teaching this because you have a whole lot of folks that go for these cults and all that good stuff. And, and we got to avoid anyone who dilutes or diminishes the work of Christ in securing our salvation. We are in Christ, not in works. We are in Christ, not in the church. We are in Christ, not in money. We are in Christ, not in a bunch of laws. We are what? In Christ. And when you read the writings of Paul, he talks about how because we are in Christ, we are justified. We have no condemnation. We are set free from the law of sin and death. We are sanctified and made acceptable. We are righteous and made holy. We become a new creature in Christ Jesus. We have the righteousness of God that covers us because of Christ. We are blessed. We are holy and blameless and covered by the love of God. We are adopted daughters and sons of God. We are forgiven of our sins. We are brought under the headship of Christ. We are God's creative art. We are being brought close to our God. We share in the promise of Jesus. We are heirs with, of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are members of the body of Christ the church and we have been given full access to God the Father and we're free from our sinful nature and one day we shall bask in the eternality of the glory of our God. That's what it means to be in Christ. That's why circumcision has no bearing on our salvation. Ah. Oh. So, so as, I, as I get ready to, to wrap this thing up, this is what I'm trying to say. The only thing that counts is when you have faith that works itself out through love. And that since you and I are saved by faith, but for these Galatians, they wanted to engage in work. Paul was basically saying this, and I close on this. This is what Paul was saying. All right, work but don't work to earn salvation. Ooh, don't work to earn salvation. Instead, because you're saved by faith, you ought to be doing some works. In, in other words, if you're really, 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 really saved, you want to work? Fine. But you ain't working to get saved. Oh, you're working because you are saved. All right, let me pull all this together, throw it in the room so we can have some good gumbo and call it a day. In other words, I don't come to church to get saved. I do it because I am saved. I don't give tithes and offerings to get saved. I do it because I am saved. I don't serve in the ministry to get saved. I do it because I am saved. I don't read my Bible to get saved. I do it because I am saved. I don't pray to get saved. I do it because I am saved. Right. Faith without works is dead. In other words, you don't get a relationship with God through a methodology. You get a relationship with God because of your faith. Here's here's how I close that my, my relationship with God through Jesus Christ has some moral claims on my life. In other words, because I'm saved, there's a certain way I ought to be living. But I don't get saved by living right. I live right because I'm saved. In other words, because I'm in relationship with Jesus Christ, that by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, it ought to energize me to love and to live the way that God will have for me to live. Uh, I close on that. And I pray that this lesson today has blessed you because I think I done taught myself happy. All right. Listen, get ready to close out. Uh, and I hope and pray that this has been a blessing to you. I do want you to know that um, uh, before I close out, let me see if there are any questions that anyone has. Any questions? Uh, any questions? Any questions? Any questions? If so, put them in the chat. Any questions? If so, put them in the chat. Put them in the chat. Uh, uh, yeah, put them in the chat. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. All right. Well, seeing as not, um, 
if 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 you have any any question, I mean any um, uh, comments, we greatly appreciate it. But hey, listen, I want want to do this right now. Um, that as we prepare to close out, that if you feel led to give uh, and and demonstrate this relationship with God, you're more than able to do that at this time. And here at, at St. Paul, there are several ways you can give. One is by mailing check a money order to the church at 1401 Allen Street, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205. Another way is by bringing check, cash, or money order to the church. But if you want to do that, uh, call the church office at 704-334-5309 to make sure someone is here to receive your offering. And we'll put it in the safe and make sure it's part of the following Sunday's count. Another way you can give is through our website, through ACS or Church Life. And then you can also give through the app called Givelify. And if you don't have that app on your smart device, download that app to your smart device connected to your favorite credit card. And in three clicks, you can give. And of course, we don't give trying to gain God's favor and approval. We give because we already have God's favor and God's love and grace and, and approval. Uh, so uh, thank you all for, for this time. I hope and pray that you will really bask in the grace of God and do what the Lord will have for you to do. God bless you and have a blessed Thursday.